So let's talk about Catherine and her ecumenicism. <laughs> I'm married to him. He's all mine. <laughs> Back off. The church is precious. Oh, if you only knew how precious is the church. How precious is the bride of Christ. If you only understand. How precious is the bride of Christ. It's the Father's gift to His Son. You can't love without giving, can The greatest gift that was possible for Him to give. He shall receive power. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long, and sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Robin. Hi, everyone. So, as you saw in the beginning clip, we are going to be talking about Catherine Kuhlman. Why are we talking about Catherine Kuhlman? It's Catherine Kuhlman Day. A few weeks ago, we did a video, and we opened up with a really creepy clip of mm. Catherine. We got more comments about that clip than we did about the entire rest of the video. So we thought, let's delve a little into her life, see what we can find, and share that information with you. Yeah, and I've got a clip right here of Catherine Kuhlman, and I want you to watch this. This is, uh, folks, this is really creepy. We wanted to give you this right here at the beginning, so check this out. I wouldn't live. If I had anything less than I had, I couldn't live. I wouldn't want to live. That fellowship that Paul was talking about in that communion with the Holy Spirit, I couldn't live without it. I couldn't. I couldn't. Everything else is so worthless. Nothing else really matters. But maybe you don't want it. Maybe you don't want the best that God has for you. Maybe there are other things that are more important to you. But oh, when once you taste when once you've experienced when once you've known what it was like to have the Holy Spirit take your body you are me why I am not weary in body after five hours. Why I am as refreshed as though I'd had five hours of rest. It's because Catherine Kuhlman hasn't done it. I haven't done anything. I've only there and I've watched the Holy Ghost do it. <laughs> I love it. We're watching this going, yeesh. Okay. Both a little scared. <laughs> so um, it's appropriate that this video is coming out on Halloween. Anyway, <laughs> I just thought I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to throw that in there. Okay. So one of the things that we do want to focus on, we're going to look at her life. We're going to look at some of the things that she did and some of the inconsistencies and some of the uh, scandals and stuff like that. But folks, as you saw in that video, there's something that's Something's not right. Yeah. And, and so the question is, is Catherine Kuhlman, or was, I should say, Catherine Kuhlman being controlled by the Holy Spirit, or was she being controlled by another spirit? And so we're going to be looking at some of the things in her life. Now, one of the things I do want to mention to the folks is that 
she was, we found out and we were both surprised, mm-hmm. she was a lot different than a lot of the a lot of the faith healers of her time. And when I say different, her meetings were different. Yeah. Um, yeah. She was different. And I was surprised when, when I look at John G. Lake or Charles Fox Parham or John Alexander Dowie or the, some of the post uh, World War Two healing revivalists right. like William Branham or or mm-hmm. Roberts. She did not run her meetings like those men did. What was she, different? Um, she definitely paved her own path in mm-hmm. the healing world so she did not have the healing prayer cards mm. she didn't have healing lines she did not lay her hands on people like some of the healers believed or stated that their healing came when they touched you and she said the holy spirit healed people so she would sense that the man in the second row was healed of a lung tumor and mm-hmm. have him come down so just a and very orderly she said god was a god of order and her services would be run in order mm-hmm. and she made it very clear and this is something we could actually do a separate video on but as you're tell, talking about that, it reminded me. She made it very clear that speaking in tongues was not the gibberish that you hear today. And she was forceful about very that. Very adamant about how speaking in tongues should take place. And when, you know, Benny, we're going to show a Benny Hen clip, I think, mm-hmm. uh, later on. But um, when Benny Hen um, operates, he, uh, you know, he he's a big Catherine Kuhlman fan. I mean, he's a Huge Catherine fan. Kuhlman mm-hmm. fanboy. He talks about her all the time. And yeah. according to what she said about how a meeting should be run and what he does, she would have she would have had no part of what Benny Hinn is doing. They would not have gotten along. No, no. no. And this is just from the research that yeah. we have. The we the, a couple of books that you have. Um, a few books. Yep. A lot of articles. Yep. Things like that. Um, so I thought that maybe we could go back and um, start a little closer to the beginning. So let's dig right in. Okay. Um, we have a number of issues over Catherine's life mm-hmm. that when we were researching really raised our eyebrows. And we want to share those with you. Yeah. The first one. Uh, Catherine was born in 1907. When she was 16 years old, she went on an evangelism tour with her sister and her sister's husband. In 1933, she kind of settled down in Denver, Colorado. Mm-hmm started the Denver Revival Tabernacle, of which she was the pastor for a number of years. Yeah, and that was her first mistake because the Bible makes it very clear that women are not to be pastors. So the point is, is that Catherine Kuhlman started out in disobedience and it just continued to spiral downhill from there. You're right. She also went on to pastor an in another church in Pennsylvania. So this was not her one and only um, pastoring yeah, and, experience. And if I remember correctly, while we were doing the research, she didn't mention her pastoring churches very often. Did she, she didn't mention it at all. She actually okay. came across as an extremely traditional viewpoint um, when she was talking about women. Okay. So she tried to leave that out of the conversation. When she was in Denver, she invited Burroughs Waltrip, an evangelist, to speak at her church. Well, they ended up becoming involved and they got married. The problem was Burroughs had been married and he divorced his wife Mm -hmm. and left his wife and two children to marry Catherine. Um, After this happened, they made this huge, happy announcement at the Denver Revival Tabernacle, Mm -hmm. people were sobbing. People got up and left because they're like, she's like, Burroughs and I are gonna join forces and we're gonna do this together. And everyone there was just burdened with the sinfulness of the situation that they had gotten themselves into. It it was big. We were reading about that and just what the, the reaction of people, people were walking like behind her in the choir. There were women who were actually leaving the choir. They were so angry. You had men who were sobbing over this story that Catherine was actually going to marry a man who had left his wife and children uh, for her. And it was yeah. it was a big it was a big situation. Yeah. Needless to say, right after that, the church just totally dissolved. I think um, she went to be with Burroughs. 
their marriage lasted maybe seven or eight years, Mm -hmm. most of which they spent kind of apart. Um, Whatever ministry he had barely held on. And once people found out that he had left his wife, they kind of stopped going to see Catherine and Burroughs. So it ended up in divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, Catherine painted an amazing picture of herself in this whole situation as a consecrated vessel to God. And um, this is what she said. She said, I can remember the day, I can remember the hour at 4 p.m. on that Saturday afternoon on a dead end street. I surrendered everything. It was all settled. And she's talking about her divorcing Burroughs. The Holy Spirit and I made each other promises, and some things you don't talk about, like personal things between a husband and wife. I knew in that moment what the scripture meant. If any man would follow me, he must take up his cross. A cross always means death. If you've never had that death of the flesh, you don't understand me. No one believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit more than Catherine Kuhlman, because I have experienced it. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, there will be a crucifying of the flesh. You will die. He doesn't ask for golden vessels. He doesn't ask for silver vessels, or he wouldn't have chosen me. All he needs is someone who will die. I spoke in an unknown tongue as he took every part of me. I surrendered everything. Then, for the first time, I realized what it meant to have power. Very, very creepy stuff. It's almost like she made this kind of covenant or pact with the Holy Spirit. And so supposedly um, now, you know, she didn't have to speak about her marriage. She didn't have to talk about it. And there was an interview that took place between her and a newspaper reporter. Yes. And do you want to talk about that just for a moment? Absolutely. In addition to creating this story that God separated me from the marriage so that I could go on and do what he wanted. She also denied having ever Mm -hmm. been married. Mm -hmm. This man, Robert Hoyt of the Akron Beacon Journal, interviewed her. She denied having ever been married. We were never married. I never took my marriage vows, she said, her eyes flashing. Do you know what happened? I'll tell you what happened. I fainted passed out completely, I tell you, right before I was about to take my vows. Shaking her finger in the face of the young reporter, she shouted, that's the truth, so help me God. Hoyt was insistent. We have a photocopy of your marriage application. If I signed an application for a marriage license, it was brought to me for my signature. I do not remember signing any such thing. Besides, I don't believe it should make any difference whether I was married or not. And that's all I'm going to say. So she lied or at least tried to cover up her marriage to Burl's Wall Trip. Now, I want to mention something to the folks about Burl's Wall Trip. I went through newspapers.com and looked this guy up. He was a I never heard of him until we started studying Catherine Kuhlman. He was a pretty popular evangelist out west, um, yeah. out west and he was in the papers a lot. And he was a shyster. So he he was um, married, of course, as we said before. And then he marries Catherine Kuhlman. He marries again. We just found that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably a few years after their divorce, he married another woman mm-hmm. who divorced him a few years after that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy um, uh, ran a radio uh, station and actually, I, I guess he owned a big share within that radio station. And that went belly up because of the marriage that took place between Catherine Kuhlman and him. Yeah. It just, everything fell apart because, well, it was a sinful situation. Yeah. One of the stories said that he said, I've never taken any money from Mm -hmm. the radio chapel as he got into his new brand new Buick and drove out of town. (laughs) So (laughs) he sums up. So, yes, yes. This man was an actual shyster and um, he kind of stepped out of the picture. But uh, he he uh, yeah, he was he was pretty bad. One more thing I want to mention about Catherine being a pastor. In one interview, they were talking to her and she had said, Well, God called me to do this. So if you have a problem, you need to talk to God about it. And Danny, it reminded me of the, um, we did a couple of videos on should women be pastors. Mm -hmm. Melissa Scott. Yes, I remember. Out in California 
Melissa Scott with the bad attitude said the same exact thing. If you've got a problem, you bring it up with Jesus because yeah. he's the one that called me. And over and over again, the Bible tells us that God is the boss. He does what he wants. He does the choosing. You don't get to choose. He chooses. So if God's calling the shots and God called me, then if you have a problem with that, take it up with him. Yeah, unbelievable. So, yeah, that's the first thing that was um, wrong with Catherine Kuhlman and her. Concerning. Can I say it? Ministry. Ministry. First two things, right? Pastoring yes, and, and the whole marriage thing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right. So now we want to focus on something else that right. is really disturbing. And that is that the people that were there at Catherine's meetings. What kind of people were at Catherine Kuhlman's yeah. services? So we've jumped forward quite a bit. After she left Burroughs, mm -hmm. she pastored a church in Pennsylvania and she moved around a little bit. And then she started having these really big healing meetings because in, I think it was like in the 40s mm -hmm. that she um, experienced her first miracle. And so she started having these huge meetings. Anyway, um, people from all walks of life would come. She loved to have people of prominence standing mm -hmm. on the stage or in the front row, especially rabbis, Catholic priests, nuns, mm -hmm. most especially if they were in their um, formal garb. She really liked that. So she was very ecumenical, mm -hmm. opened the doors to everyone yeah. and believed that she needed to create a, a peace between all of us. Yeah. Big problem there. Don't we have a little clip we showing do. what she says about this? Absolutely. So this is Catherine Kuhlman talking about the different types of people that come to her services. On the other hand, the word of God speaks of the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the closing moments of this dispensation. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And he's promised us that in these last moments before the Holy Spirit leaves, there'll be a great outpouring, a marvelous outpouring of the spirit. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it among the Protestants. We're seeing it among those in Catholicism. We're seeing it among men and women of every walk of life. One of the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that this world has ever seen is being evidenced today. All right. So I just have a little brief paragraph to read about her um, view of the the Catholics and her relationship with them. She was very prominent in promoting a oneness union between Protestants and Catholics. When she spoke with Pope, Pope Paul, she said, when I met Pope Paul, there was a oneness. This oneness was carried into and through her interdenominational healing services until her death. Part of what defines Protestant Christianity is the disagreement over Catholic doctrines, such as Mary being another mediator between man and God. For Kuhlman, for Kuhlman, this division was non-existent because her form of Protestant Christianity was not explicitly defined by the, by the Bible. Instead, it was experiential in nature, mm -hmm. and any who shared the experience, regardless the theology, were in unity with her. So then, if you take that view, where experience is the most important thing, to its logical conclusion, then what you have is, you, well, you, you can... Look at a Hindu who has the same types of experiences. Or what about, you know, Mormons who actually yes. uh, are very um, moral and they actually have spiritual experiences and, so. and, and they call that the Holy Spirit. They mm -hmm. speak in tongues. So, I mean, you know, it's just it, it it's elevating experience over the Bible, which is unfortunately is what Catherine Kuhlman did a lot. Yeah, you're right. But the person of the Holy Spirit is in the earth. He moves upon people. He moves upon great congregations. And it is really the power of the Holy Spirit. It is really the person of the Holy Spirit that people feel when they talk about this 
tingling power that's going through their bodies. And yet Hindus experience the very same thing in their meetings, and I've shown that in other videos. Just because somebody's experiencing a tingling feeling going through their body does not mean that that is the Holy Spirit. You know, that's part of how she views the Holy Spirit, though, mm -hmm. and I know we wanted to talk about that. Yes. I'm just going to read a brief excerpt on um, what she says about the Holy Spirit. Kuhlman often focused solely on spiritual things instead of traditional biblical teaching. For example, she coined some of the terminology for slain in the spirit, teaching that our spiritual beings are not wired for God's full power. And when we plug into that power, we just cannot survive it. We are wired for low voltage. God is high voltage through the Holy Spirit. This is inconsistent with scripture. It far exceeds and adds to what the Bible very often teaches about the Holy Spirit, namely that he is a helpful helper, a comforter, and our sanctification, not one who is an electric power to shock us to the floor. Where in scripture do you ever find that? You don't. You don't find it anywhere. There's nothing about electricity going through the body. I will say this. Other religions also talk about electricity um, going through the body. The woman that was uh, studying under a Hindu um, guru in one of our mm -hmm. former videos talked about Shaktipat after she came out of this weeping emotional experience that she was experiencing for days, her whole life was radically changed. The guru actually transmits his own consciousness into you, you see, and it it's it's fully intelligent and continues to function inside you it was as though a sonic boom had occurred just above my head and I don't know exactly how to describe it except that a level of my being was open that I never knew existed it was absolutely incredible tremendous love tremendous ecstasy and this went on for about two weeks. I mean, I was a complete basket case. It was all I could do to put one foot in front of the other. You know, I mean, I'm, I tried to be a very controlled person. I very much just like freaking out in front of other people. So I, it was about two weeks before I could chant without weeping. You know, I mean, it was, it was a terribly, terribly profound experience. And I found that it never leaves. And it's just, it, this is, th there's no proof, no evidence that this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never elevates himself in scripture. Never. He is always pointing to Jesus Christ. Listen to what the scripture says. I'm going to start in John 16, 14 through 15. This is um, Jesus speaking to his disciples. He, talking about the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father is mine. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 10. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, the things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 18. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same Spirit, or into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit." The Holy Spirit's job is to point us to Jesus Christ, not to elevate himself. So true. You know, while you're reading those, I'm also thinking that tying in with her view of the Holy Spirit is how her meetings were conducted mm -hmm. and what happened at her meetings. I can tell you that there were just thousands and thousands of healings that had been recorded going on in her meetings. You can look back 
And many of them were verified by by doctors. She always wanted to have a doctor like on stage Mm -hmm. with her. They were verified by doctors. Many of them were unverified after the fact. So there's just so much confusion about what actually really happened at those meetings. Yeah. But along with an an unhealthy obsession with the Holy Spirit, some people had a very unhealthy view of her. Of and Catherine. I think we have a couple of clips yeah. that go along with that. Yeah. And watch as we play these clips for you, how they elevate Catherine Kuhlman to almost a godlike status. True. And so here we're standing, and it happened so suddenly, like we went from, forgive me for saying it, we went from the flesh to the spirit in a second when she walked in the pla- on the platform. She brought the glory on the platform and into the sanctuary with her. Here you're sitting talking with somebody, the organ is playing gently behind you, you're not really aware that within seconds God was walking in because God walked in when she walked in. It is possible, please, now you, you may miss this, I hope you don't. It is possible to be so close to Jesus that your presence becomes his presence. That was Miss Kuhlman. Her physical presence brought him in. I remember times that woman did not say a word. She just walked in and people were healed. She had, she, I don't remember her ever preaching those Friday morning meetings in Pittsburgh. She would just walk in, just step in, and the miracles would happen. She did not have to sing a song. Nobody had to play an organ. Those things were uh, for us, not her. But I'm going to tell you something. Here the glory of God was so thick and so real and so rich. As we're standing, and then we all sat down, you could still feel that amazing. And I, again, the word feel doesn't say it, but I think you know what I mean. And we sat down, this woman comes up and talks about her healing from Australia. And I thought, I don't believe it. And that glory lifted off of me. And Catherine came out and you could feel the electricity of what she carried went from the pulpit to the balcony. It filled the whole room. Some people can only fill up to the three sections or three rows. She had enough anointing and when she walked out, it filled every building to the back row of the top of the building. And she would just talk a little bit and cry a little bit and talk a little bit and cry a little bit and then all of a sudden that power would begin to start moving. I saw a wind blow across the wheelchair section and no exaggeration about 30 crippled people jumped up out of their wheelchairs and ran off no one talked to them no one gave a word of knowledge the power got in and 30 of them jumped up and ran sure they did roberts liardin Sure they did. I mean, Learden. Um, so bad. So, um, yeah, this is just, again, this is what these guys do. They elevate her almost to a godlike status. And you were mentioning mm-hmm. uh, before we played the clips about the doctors the and doctors on stage, on yeah. stage and, the, and, and that. And here's a clip. Uh, and listen to what this nurse actually says about Catherine Kuhlman. I came reluctantly to the shrine the first time because I was a physician who was skeptical of these, quote, miracle services. But as I sat in the auditorium and watched Catherine Kuhlman come onto the stage, all of a sudden she was transfigured, enveloped in a beautiful golden light. And this was like a mandate from God. Here is my teacher, hear her. That was, uh, yeah, that, 
that clip is even more shocking, I think, than the Benny Hinn and the Roberts Leardons that we we listen to when they describe it. Because I, I don't know. It, it's just it, it amazes me that so many people don't see the creepiness and right. just the the the. the, the I, I mean, honestly, honey, we're researching this stuff. And I'm just getting creep vibes all over watching yeah, her. Absolutely. And there are like there might be a Bible teacher that I elevate and say he's a man of God. He's a mm -hmm. godly man. But never would I say when he walks in the room, God walks in the room. That's just a different level of obsession. Or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Ugh. Absolutely. You know, we have one last section to talk about, and that is um, Catherine's financial issues that she mm -hmm. had that kind mm -hmm. of peppered throughout her career. The first one that I remember reading about was in Franklin, Pennsylvania, um, in her church there. She was sued by the people that owned the uh, building that she had her services in. I guess they had an agreement that she would pay a certain percentage of the tithes to those people. And she was not doing that. So they sued her. She allegedly was not doing that. So they sued her for $20,000. Well, it turned into this huge fight. She countersued. People were putting ads in the papers and she eventually moved out. Later on in her career, near the end of her life, she had a lot of financial issues. She got involved with a man named Tink Wilkerson, who was a car dealer, mm -hmm. who later in life ended up in prison for his shady dealings. And wasn't Tink Wilkerson um, a big part of Or Roberts' ministry? He was a regent at his university, okay. I think. Okay. So um, she got involved with him. She ended up um, taking his advice against the advice of trusted people in her life. And she was renting like one of his Lear jets for $10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. She was sued by her agent because she allegedly was not paying him what she owed him. Mm -hmm. um, people claimed she had millions of million dollars worth of jewelry and a huge amount of money in paintings. She was supposedly spending a, a lavish amount on her wardrobe. Um, but when she died, I don't know if Tink got to her before she died, but she did not have a huge amount of money at the end of her life. Yeah. And uh, the will was changed, by the way. Tink Wilkerson also uh, had her change her will or helped her, I should say helped her change her will yes and guess who was the biggest beneficiary of yeah, all yeah and uh so and, and and just mentioning in passing there's no evidence of this there's no proof of this at all but there are those that we have read that said it's possible that oral roberts had actually uh, was actually it's behind, it all. behind all of this in Tink, Tink Wilkerson's whole um, scam, as you, if you want to call it that. But it, and it wouldn't surprise me, but no evidence that we can say that that actually happened. But right. anyway. So these were some of the issues we found when we were researching Catherine Kuhlman's life. Uh, number one, she was a pastor. And we know what God's word says mm -hmm. about a woman being a pastor yeah. and having authority over a man. Number two, her marriage and divorce scandal mm -hmm. hurt just countless numbers of people. Yeah. Um, number three, she was ecumenical. She embraced everyone on that stage and didn't seem to have a lot of firm theology in her teaching. And visited the Pope and said that when she did visit the Pope, she was at one with him. She felt yes, at one with him. Yeah, that's true. Um, speaking of her bad theology, her Holy Spirit teachings were mm -hmm. off. Way too much emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And of course, we ended with her financial scandals. So, folks, Catherine Kuhlman is not the teacher that Benny Hinn, Robert Slearden, and others make her out to be. She's a dangerous false teacher, and she needs to be, like all the other false teachers from the past and the present, marked and avoided. Thanks for watching. Bye.